What's going on, engineers? In this next installment of the Let's Learn Rust series, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Rust compiler, talking about Rust variables, functions, and then some strings. So let's just jump right in. The first thing you need to know about the Rust compiler and something that you're gonna learn really fast is that it's extremely strict. One of Rust's main value props is the ability to eliminate a lot of runtime crashes at compile time. So because of that, the compiler has a zero tolerance policy on any code that you might write that may cause a crash at runtime. You will get frustrated by the Rust compiler. There's really no way around it, but just know that the Rust compiler is doing it to help make your program really good. There is a silver lining, however, although the Rust compiler is very strict and it's going to complain about a lot of things, in many cases, it will not only tell you exactly what's wrong, but it'll give you a suggestion on how to solve it. So in this small program I have, which is made up of one line of code, Rust already has a problem with it. There's a little triangle with an exclamation part in the middle. And if I put my mouse over it, it says unused variable. So let's just run this real quick so we can get a better view of it. So cargo run, and you can see that there's a problem. Now this is just a warning. The program is still compiled and I can still run it, but Rust is saying, hey, we're warning you, this is an unused variable, so you might want to fix it. In this case, not only is it telling you that you probably should fix it, it's also just straight up telling you how you should fix it. It's saying, help, consider prefixing with an underscore, underscore A. And then what the underscore will do is it will eliminate the unused variable warning. So if I come back to my code and I stick an underscore under there, you can see the warning goes away. And then when I run it a second time, it runs without issue. I've uncommented my second line of code here, and now we have another problem, except this time it's red, which means there's an error. It's also worth mentioning that if, if you have a modern editor, it should support integration with the Rust compiler. So you can actually just mouse over these different errors and you can actually see what it is right in your editor without having to run cargo run. In these videos, we're gonna actually execute the code. That way we get really huge, nice errors so we can just review them together. So let's see what's wrong with this code. Come over here, do cargo run, and we get an error here. In this case, the error is mismatch types. It's saying expected empty tuple found array of three elements. Now it's not telling us exactly how to fix it. However, it is saying it expected type empty tuple, but found type integer of a length of three. So the reason this is an error is because I supplied the wrong type. What I need to supply is an actual array of three integers here. So although it didn't explicitly state what to do with this found type, what I can actually do is I can copy what's right here. I can come back to my editor and I can drop that in place of the parentheses here. And then I can replace integer with the type of integer I want, which will do just I32. And then you'll see now when I run my code, everything is fine. Don't worry if you don't understand the typing system just yet. We're gonna cover some of that in this video and also later videos. This technique I actually showed you a second ago is actually really helpful for figuring out the type of something because if you're not sure exactly what it is, like I have two string literals here, and again, we're gonna talk about strings in a little bit, and but I don't know what the exact type is. So what you can do is you can just drop an empty tuple in here and then run cargo run, and then it'll tell you what the type is. It'll say the actual type is a string slice, two elements. And then just like the previous example, I can copy this type exactly from the compiler message and drop it in place of the parentheses, and then my code is fixed. I know I jumped a little bit ahead here, but let's switch gears a little bit and talk about variables. So in Rust, the signature for defining a new variable is use the let keyword. So you say let, and then you do the name of the variable. In this case, we'll do num, and then you do a colon, and then you specify its type. So in this case, if I want it to just be an integer, say a 32-bit integer, I can do i32, and then you do an equal sign, and then you supply the actual number. One really cool feature about Rust is that you can redefine a variable with the same name but a different type and it'll actually shadow that variable and replace it with the new one. So in this case, if I wanted this to be a float, I could do let num1, again, same name, colon f32 equals, say, 3.3. And then now I've replaced that. Now when you're adding types to your variables, the Rust compiler is actually smart enough to infer the type based on the value. So if you know that you're gonna use, say, an integer, all you really have to do is let num1 equals four. And that's sufficient because the Rust compiler can look at a four and say, okay, well that's an integer. And then it can automatically assign a type to the num1 variable. There are times where you're required to be explicit about the type, but that's only when the Rust compiler cannot figure out what the type is gonna be for you. One example of this is going to be vectors. Now we'll talk about vectors later in another video, but for this example, understand that vectors hold a series of elements of the same type. So if you do something like let a equals vec new, then Rust is gonna complain about that. It's gonna say, 
cannot infer type for t. And that's because I haven't actually inserted anything into this vector, so it doesn't know what type A should be. You know, is it a vector of integers? Is it a vector of floats? Is it a vector of strings? Because Rust has no clue about that, it requires you to come here and say, well, it is a vector of I32. The last thing we need to talk about for Rust variables is this idea of mutability. And by default, things in Rust are immutable, meaning you cannot change them. So if I do something like let num2 equals 56, then that's all well and good. But what if I want to reassign that value? So I'll do num2 equals 66, and then you'll see that the Rust compiler is going to complain about that. So let's come over here and run the program and see what's wrong. So the error it's giving us is cannot assign twice to a mutable variable num2, and then it's actually going to help us and tell us what to do. It says help make this binding mutable, mute num2. Okay, thank you Rust compiler. I will come back here and I will add mute right there, and then magically it's all fixed. By adding this mute keyword after let, you're telling the Rust compiler that you intend to change that value at some point in the future. But if you put the mute, keyword there after let, but you don't actually change the variable, again, the Rust compiler is going to complain. As usual, it has something to say about that. It says, unused variable num2, variable does not need to be mutable. And then again, you get some help. Remove this mute. Next we're going to talk about is strings. First type of string we're going to talk about is the immutable literal stored in read-only data. This is going to be the type of literal that is actually baked right into the binary and it cannot be modified. It can only be read. This type definition here is probably a little scary looking, but what this says is it's a string slice with a static lifetime, meaning it will last the entirety of the program. This is probably a little easier to understand if I first remove the lifetime. So if I take that out of there, what I'm left with is a string slice. And now that I have a string slice, I set it of a static lifetime by putting that like it is here. We'll talk more about string slices in a second, so don't worry. The next type of string we're going to look at is a growable string that's stored on the heap that may or may not be mutable, depending on whether or not you use the mute keyword. To concatenate new strings onto name2, we can do it one of a couple ways. The first way is to use the standard plus operator to do concatenation, and this is probably something that you recognize from other languages. The second way is using the push string method, and then we'll just put a print statement here for this. Next we're going to talk about is string slices. String slices is going to be a portion of a string and it's going to be an immutable portion, a view into a string. So in this case, if I wanted to specify name three, which would be the value of engineer and name four would be the value of man, I could do it like this. So generally string slices are in the format of starting index up to ending index. However, what you can do is you can omit the starting index and then that just means start from the beginning. And then you can omit the ending index, and that means go to the end. So really what this says is take a slice starting from the beginning up to the eighth index, and then take a slice starting at the ninth index to the end. And this is why, predictably, if we add a print statement which prints each of these out and we run the program, we can see that it does engineer space man. One word is engineer, one word is man. So now that you know what string slices are, let's jump back up to this string literal. The reason this is a string slice is because it's giving you a view into the read-only data. In the same way down here, it gives us a view into this growable string. So just a quick recap, static lifetime string slices are going to be string literals that are baked right into the binary. You can use the string type and string new to create an actual growable string on the heap. And you can use string slices again with the start dot dot end notation for the range to take a view into a growable string. And finally, the last thing we're going to discuss is functions. So we'll start with a variable name, and we will do a string on the heap with a initial value of engineer man. What I want to do now is I want to write a function to get the length of that string. So to do a function, we start off by writing fn is the keyword, and then the name of the function you want to do. So in our case, we'll do get length. Inside parentheses, it's going to be arguments in the format of name and then type. So in this case, we'll have an argument called like s colon, and then the type will be a string slice. And after this is where you specify the return value if there is one. So since the length is going to be a number, we will do dash caret u size, and then brackets. Now you notice that there's an error, and the compiler is complaining about the fact that I've told it that it's a return type of u size, but it's not actually returning anything yet. Of course, we're going to fix that, but you can see that it already knows there's a problem. So again, the length of the string is simple because we have a method called chars that we can call, and then we can call the count method on that, which will give us the actual length of it. 
So this is actually the end of our function here, and you might notice two things that's kind of weird. Number one is that I didn't actually write return, and number two is that I don't have a semicolon on this line. So by default, what Rust does is it will return the value of the last executed line that it does as long as it does not have a semicolon. So that means that what I've written here is functionally equivalent to adding a semicolon, which you see now is an actual error, and then putting a return statement ahead of it, and now it's fine. So calling this function is similar to other languages. You could do something like let size equals get length name. In this case, you have to specify ampersand so you can let it borrow that value. Rust has this concept of ownership and borrowing, and we're going to talk about it at length in another video, but you'll get a quick taste on what effect it has in your program here in a moment. We can put our print line here, and then we can just try out our program real quick. You can see it says engineer man is 12 characters. And that's what we expect it to say. So I made a new function here called take ownership. And all it does is it takes in a string and it prints out that string and that's it. And this is where it gets a little dicey when you start passing around variables to different functions. So I'm gonna come up here and I'm actually gonna execute that take ownership function. And I'm gonna pass it the name here. And that's not gonna be a problem. That's gonna work perfectly fine. The problem is when I go to actually use that name variable again. So in this case, I'm gonna try to just print it out and you can see the compiler is gonna, gonna complain. So when I run this, we can see that we got a problem here. It says value borrowed here after move. The reason this occurs is because variables in Rust can only have one owner and that's it. When you transfer the ownership to somewhere else and you don't transfer it back, the variable actually goes out of scope and it deallocates the memory. And that's exactly what happened here. So what occurred here is I had name, it got past the take ownership function, and then as soon as this function returned, it actually deallocated name, and that's it, it's gone. So, but then when you try to print it out, see normally this would cause a program crash, but because the Rust compiler is very strict, it's saying, hey look, you're trying to use a variable that's already deallocated and you can't do that, therefore the program doesn't compile. So you might be thinking to yourself now, why is that not the case with get length? And that's because I, su I supplied this ampersand, which says this is now a borrowed value. It's saying the get length function can borrow this variable, but once it returns, then it comes back. Well, not that it comes back, it just means that it was never, the ownership of the variable is never transferred. Of course, this is a very simple fix though. What I'll do is I'll rename this function from take ownership to, you know, borrow name. And then rather than passing it name directly, I'm going to give it a borrowed value. And then down here, I'm gonna add an ampersand from the string. Now what this says is this should take a borrowed version of that variable. Now, as I said, it's okay if you don't understand this. The, the concept of ownership and borrowing is extremely complicated and we'll definitely cover it at length in its own video. So let's just make one more function that adds two numbers and returns the sum of those numbers. So again, fn, name of the function, we'll call it add. We're gonna have two things here. We'll do like n1, which is a 32-bit integer, and then n2, which is a 32-bit integer, and we'll say it returns a 32-bit integer. And then here, all I do is n1 plus n2. And again, no semicolon. All I gotta do is just leave it just like that, and it'll return it back to the caller. And then I can just try that out here. And run my program. And you see everything works well, three and nine. And the last thing I do for functions, I'm gonna show you how to modify a borrowed value from within a function. So imagine you have a variable like let num equals one. So we'll create our function, we'll do fn, we'll call it inc for incrementer, and then in here we'll do n1, and then the type needs to be a mutable borrowed version of that value. So it'd be ampersand mute i32, and then inside here is where you'll actually add one to the variable. So to do that, you must first dereference it, and dereferencing is done the same way as like c. So you do star n1 equals star n1 plus one. So to do this, you simply pass num to that function. But if you do it this way, you'll notice the compiler is gonna complain. And the reason it's complaining is because you're not passing a borrowed value, so you gotta add an ampersand. And once you add the ampersand, now the compiler is still gonna complain. And its complaint now is that you haven't passed it as a mutable borrow. So what you have to do is you have to add mute here. And then you click save, and then now the compiler is still complaining. Now the compiler is saying that although you've passed a mutable borrow of the num variable, the variable num itself is not mutable. So I gotta add mute here as well. 
And now the compiler is satisfied. And although it's very strict and it's very explicit, it's doing it just so there's no problems at runtime. Now we can run our program real quick and we can see that everything works well. And that's it for the video. We took a look at the compiler and showed you how you can work with it rather than against it. We looked at doing some variables as well as worked with some strings and then worked with some functions. We also very briefly dipped our toes into this stuff we call ownership and borrowing. And again, we're gonna go at length into that because it will be its own video because it's so complicated. But once you get the hang of it, it's not too bad. And we're done. If you have any questions or comments about anything you saw in this video, please be sure to let me know them in the comments below. And otherwise, I hope to see you on the next video. Take care.